These playful puppies are African wild dogs. Only distantly related to domestic dogs, they will grow up to be among the most fearsome killers in the animal world. Adult dogs, the warthog, twice their size, is usually an easy prey. But it can be dangerous, and the pups rush to the safety of their den. The warthog also seeks refuge underground. But the hole is too shallow, and it must find another. dogs usually kill quickly and efficiently, but only to feed themselves and their puppies. They are innocent killers. Except for their savage reputation, little has been known about them. Now, as a single pack is studied and photographed by animal behaviorist Jane Goodall and her husband Hugo Van Lauwek, there will be an intimate film record of their daily lives. Lake Lagaja on the Serengeti plains of Tanzania. Every day from their camp on the edge of the lake, Jane Goodall, famed for her study of chimpanzees, and her husband, wildlife photographer Hugo Van Lauwek, accompanied by their four-year-old son, nicknamed Grub, begin anew their search for the pack of 15 African wild dogs they've been studying for two years. Their task is a difficult one, for the dogs are nomadic and a pack may wander over an area of 1,000 square miles. Because of the vast distances that the dogs travel, it is almost impossible to observe them regularly. However, we knew that the dominant female of the pack we had been studying, the Genghis pack, was probably due to give birth. We had previously seen havoc as we named her being mated. Now, for about three months, the pack would give up their nomadic life to remain in one place to look after Havoc's puppies. It would be an ideal time to study their relationships. If only we could find somewhere in the vastness around us the Genghis pack and its nursery den. It's the beginning of the dry season and the annual migration of many of the Serengeti's animals is in progress. Soon the short grass of the plains will wither and most of the water holes will dry. Slowly the wildebeests, over a half a million of them, return toward the bush country where water and grass will be more plentiful. As the country becomes almost desert-like, the last of the great herds depart in a single line that stretches for 10 miles. It is a long and arduous journey, and some, weakened by old age or disease, will collapse along the way. The 
quick kill by predators may sometimes be preferable to deaths like this. The search for the Genghis pack goes on, covering about 60 miles a day, day after day. It begins to seem hopeless. Then suddenly, after three weeks, there is a glimpse of reward. We had found the female lotus, formerly of the Genghis pack. When lotus had come into heat, she was driven out of the pack by Havoc, the dominant female. Lotus's mate, Renogo, had followed her. Apparently, they were still outcasts. We drove on, and suddenly we heard the singular sounds of wild dogs. There they were, Brutus, Swift, Rasputin, and all the others, the Genghis pack at last. We have always been most interested in the behavior of individual animals and their relationships. If by now, Havoc had had her pups, the dogs would remain in this area for more than two months. Havoc had indeed had her puppies, 10 of them. Now we would be able to observe in detail the various aspects of the dog's individual lives. Havoc is the only black dog in the pack. Upon the death of the male Genghis, she had become the pack's leader. Her pups, a month old, must have recently emerged from their den for the first time. For the adult dogs, and of the males especially Brutus, pups are the center of attention. There, strangely standing apart, was Angel. Yet among the females, none had been so attached to pups as she. Angel herself was pregnant now. Havoc was watching her. Angel's stump of a tail wagged submissively as Havoc stalked her. Angel was displaying extreme submission. We were puzzled by Havoc's behavior. Perhaps she could not tolerate another adult female getting close to her pups and was warning Angel to keep away. And Angel, so attached to puppies, kept her distance. For Havoc's puppies, the den of their birth has provided security. Now only four weeks old, they meet with their first traumatic experience. Angel looks on as one by one the pups are carried by Havoc to another den, 20 yards away. The odors of the den area may attract predators, especially hyenas and wild dog mothers regularly move their pups. Angel had helped in carrying puppies the year before. Within an hour, all of Havoc's pups have been moved to the new den.
Suddenly the dogs greet one another. It is a ritual that often precedes a hunt. Habit will remain behind to guard her young. The still distant angel will try to join them. Angel is too heavily pregnant to easily catch up. The dogs move slowly, enabling them to get within close proximity of their most common prey, the Thompson gazelle. Swift, the speediest of the pack, leaves the others far behind. Gazelles can run up to 45 miles an hour over short distances, but wild dogs can maintain a speed of 30 miles an hour for several miles. Angel is still far off, as now the entire pack begins to close in. An individual quarry selected, the pursuit is relentless. After three and a half miles, the gazelle is tiring. The exhausted gazelle begins to run in circles. attempts to share in the kill. She loses her last scrap to a spotted hyena. Their meal finished, the dogs return to the den to feed Havoc and her pups. Puppies are fed by regurgitation. Wild dogs can store meat in their stomachs for 12 hours. So one kill may suffice to feed the puppy several times throughout the day. In adult dogs, the urge to regurgitate to puppies seems to be strong. In a short while, Angel returned. It seemed that she longed to go over to the pups so that she too might feed them. Slowly she began to approach, even though Havoc was watching. No longer would Angel be tolerated. It became apparent that Havoc was driving Angel from the pack. Off Angel wandered, an outcast, alone. Brutus, whom we knew to be Angel's mate, did not follow her but remained behind with Havoc's puppies in the pack. She would soon give birth, but unlike the other outcast, Lotus, she would have no mate to hunt and bring back food for her and her puppies. Until she had given birth, she would be too heavy with her unborn litter to hunt for herself. We followed her for some miles. She seemed tired and dejected.
she plodded on. And then she simply stopped and called her distress. The camp overlooking Lake Pagaja. While Grubb tends to his tame Egyptian vultures, Jane tends to the growing volume of notes. Hugo has gone in search of Angel. Machoria had joined us to help look after Grubb. I think it would be hard to find a healthier or happier boy. Before Grubb was born, Hugo and I had decided we would not let his arrival change our life in the wild. Having replenished his food and fuel, Hugo had set out to look for Angel. But first he was to make a quick visit to the pack. Genghis Peck was just returning from a hunt to feed Havoc and her pups. To my amazement, there was Angel emerging from a den. Swift approached her. Angel had apparently had her puppies. She needed food, but Swift hurried away from her. Begging for meat, she ran from one dog to another, but she was ignored. She was still an outcast. Havoc was relentless. Then the other dogs joined in the attack as Angel desperately sought the safety of her den. Havoc tried to cut her off, but somehow Angel made it, blocking the entrance, leaving Havoc to dig in frustration at the top. As Havoc heard Angel's pups, she seemed to display a hatred such as I have only once before seen in an animal. I was fascinated to see Brutus, Angel's mate, approach her den. Angel begged for food and Brutus fed her. It was probably her first meal in days. Now, stealthily, Havoc made her way toward the unprotected den. Angel was too busy to notice. stolen and killed one of Angel's newborn pups. There was nothing Angel could do and she returned to the den. Only Havoc's puppies are visible and available for feeding, so he gives them all his food, while Angel and his own puppies are starving. In Brutus's preoccupation with Havoc's pups, Angel is forsaken. Havoc watches as Angel, forced by hunger, leaves her pups to look for food.
as Angel desperately searches for leftovers from Havoc's pups, Havoc nears the unprotected den. Another of Angel's pups is taken and killed. And another. Repeatedly, starvation forces Angel from her den. And again and again, the scene is repeated. Every day for Angel, there is tragically one less hungry mouth to feed. other female is attached to pups, finds the broken body of one of her own offspring. By now, only one living puppy remains in the den. This time, Angel is alert. Angel's sole concern is to get to her pup first, and she does. If Havoc should follow, she'd get a bite on her nose. Havoc returned to her pups, but we felt it was just a matter of time. Angel could not for long stay below with her last pup. She had to find food. Angel was too late. We suddenly realized the puppy was still alive. Then Havoc carried it down into her own den. Angel heard her puppy's cries. As Havoc emerged, Angel hesitated. And she cringed submissively. To our surprise, Havoc did not attack her. Possibly now that she had stolen all the pups, Havoc was satisfied. Perhaps she'd not killed the last one because it was closer in size to her own. Now Havoc even allowed Angel to join her pup and share her den. A week later, preceded by her mother, Angel's sole surviving puppy emerged. She was four weeks younger than Havoc's pups and stunted from starvation. We named her Solo. Solo was immediately surrounded by the older puppies. In the darkness of the den, they had all been living peacefully together. Now Havoc's pups started to maul Solo. Their teeth were needle sharp. Furtively, Angel tried to extricate Solo and carry her to safety. Havoc rushed over. She seized Solo from the security of the den and returned her to her own pups. Angel called to Solo, mobbed and mauled even more than before. Pulled in all directions, 
Solo tried to get back to her mother, but Angel did not dare to help her under Havoc's watchful eye. Solo was weak and undernourished. We hoped she could survive. For four weeks, Jane and Hugo have kept an almost constant vigil at the den side of the Genghis pack. It always surprised me to see Solo emerge from the den in spite of the mauling she usually received. She seemed a plucky youngster, as well as a very hungry one. Solo depended on her mother's milk, but Angel had become such a nervous dog that she could rarely stand still long enough to allow Solo to suckle. By now, Havoc's pups were eight weeks old. Although they were on a regular diet of meat, they still tried to suckle, to Havoc's obvious displeasure. Their sharp teeth hurt. It was time they were weaned. Unlike Havoc's pups, Solo needed milk for her survival. Still hungry, she pursued her mother to find Havoc's pups suckling from Angel. Now, Solo would have to compete for her mother's milk with the ten sharp-toothed pups rejected by their own mother, and Angel, too, had to bear it. The pups demanded feeding, and with Havoc nearby, Angel did not dare deny them. With their dominant mother to support them, the pups took excessive liberties, and Angel had to suffer these too. Then Angel could tolerate it no longer. Instantly, she was punished for her insubordination. She was forced to leave Solo and retreat to the den. Havoc's pups seldom left Solo unmolested. It seemed their hunting instincts were developing, with Solo for now the prey. We began to fear for her life. Yet, though she squealed pathetically and tried to get away, we never saw her make a submissive gesture. The brutal game is suddenly interrupted. The arrival of a swarm of bees makes common victims of all the dogs of the Genghis pack. With bees clinging to her back, Solo is apparently unable to find the den. As suddenly as they arrived, the bees depart, and the assault upon Solo resumes. She has begun to lose the hair on her tail, and even worse, the tips of her ears. Desperately, she struggles to reach the den from which she first emerged two weeks before. It is her only safety. The den area is visited daily by Egyptian vultures and half-collared ravens in search of scraps of meat discarded by the pups. 
Havoc's offspring, at first wary, discover a new game. Between pups and bird, it's a game of intimidation. Solo has never engaged in play. Havoc ends the game. The pack hunts at least once every day. Zebras are very large prey, which most other packs seldom if ever tackle, but they are the specialty of the Genghis pack. Zebras are not very fast. They run closely bunched together so the stallions can defend the mares. dogs avoid the stallions and concentrate on a lagging female. To slow the zebra down, the closest dog tries to grab its tail. the zebra is held by its lip while the other dogs move in for the kill. A kill like this is always horrifying to watch, that the animal is in such a profound state of shock that it feels little or nothing, and within a few minutes, it is dead. It was the middle of the dry season and food was getting scarce. The dogs gorged themselves, but the zebra is a large animal and more than three quarters would be left for the scavengers. Although vultures and marabou storks may arrive on the scene first, they must make way for the hyena. nothing would be wasted. Havoc's pups, ever hungry, scrambled for their share. By now, Solo too needed meat. Havoc's puppies were voracious feeders, and we wondered how Solo could possibly compete. Solo had been successful in competing for meat. It was heartening to see her at last, apparently determined to hold her own. From now on, Solo would fight back. Hunting becomes increasingly difficult for the Genghis pack. Most of its prey have left the sun-scorched plains for greener pastures. The dogs have not eaten for two days when once again, they go through the ritual of the greeting ceremony that usually precedes a hunt. But this time, it means that they will be leaving the den for good. 
to resume their nomadic life. Hugo will follow the pack day and night. The dogs will travel up to 10 miles a day and cover an area of more than a thousand square miles. Solo is four weeks too young for the journey, while Havoc's pups, 12 weeks old, are ready for the nomadic life. day before the sun set, the dogs had traveled six miles, solo running all the way. On these treks, due mostly to roaming hyenas, pup mortality is high. I hoped that aided by Angel, solo somehow would manage to keep up. By the second day of its trek, the Genghis pack has traveled more than 10 miles. For six weeks, no rain has fallen over the dried up plains, and the Serengeti has become a hostile place where only the strongest can survive. Lagging pups are looked after, but Solo constantly falls behind. The pack rushes back to defend its youngest. The cheetah may be the fastest of mammals, but it is outnumbered. The confrontation gives Solo an opportunity to catch up. Mile after mile, for every step the other dogs take, Solo has to take three. In the afternoon, the dogs usually rested, and exhausted Solo needed all the rest she could get. Only too soon would the pack continue toward the Gaul Mountains and the possibility of food. The dogs traveled on. It was four days since they had fed on the zebra, and now, on this barren plain, starvation threatened. Hyenas, observing the pack, were starving too. Usually considered scavengers, Hyenas are also successful predators. Brutus rushed to Solo's aid. If Solo was to survive, she had to keep up with the pack, which, with each passing day, would be less willing to wait for her. With boldness forced by hunger, a hyena persists. It's Angel who leads the attack. Then the entire pack enters the fray. The hyena's bottom is its most vulnerable part. And to protect it, the hyena races toward a shallow den and sits in it. It becomes a trap. <laughs> The dogs avoid the hyena's powerful jaws, which could easily crush them. The 
dogs are relentless, but they will kill only what they eat. This hyena will follow the pack no more. Once more, Sola had to catch up. The dogs were on the move again. Quickly, Angel picked her up. She would carry her. But not for long. Angel was not allowed to carry her own puppy, and Havoc reproached her. Now the survival of the entire pack depends on finding food. They can no longer afford to be delayed by Solo, as always trailing behind. It has been six days since the dogs have eaten. They press on, leaving Solo farther and farther behind. As the pack recedes from view, Solo quickens her pace and calls. But the dogs have reached the Goal Mountains and cannot hear her. Since leaving the den, Solo has run for 40 miles and can run no more. She is alone and lost. By driving and sleeping in turns, Hugo and his assistant, James Malcolm, have been following the pack on its trek. Now they return to camp, where Jane and Grubb await them. Of course, Jane and Grubb wanted most of all to know how Solo had fared. Hello, Grubb. Little did they expect that James and I had rescued Solo and brought her back. Oh, look at the puppy. It would be unwise, even dangerous, to keep a wild dog as a pet, although it was difficult to resist Solo's charms. Sola had not eaten for nearly a week. Now, for the first time in her life, she would not need to compete for food. As soon as she was strong enough, we planned to return her to the Genghis pack. In search of the pack, Hugo returns to the plains beyond the Goal Mountains. He intends to follow the dogs until the time Solo is ready to be released. But the dogs have disappeared. They may have moved off in any direction. If Hugo did not find the pack, the only alternative for Solo would be imprisonment in a zoo. She would be a captive for the rest of her life. It was a depressing thought. Day after day, Hugo continued the search, and there was still no sign of the pack. Bushfires are common at this time of year when the plains are so dry. No doubt the fires had forced the gazelles and other animals in the area to move on. Perhaps somewhere behind them was the Genghis pack. For 
four weeks the search went on. Perhaps the dogs had gone into the mountains or into the Olduvai Gorge where Hugo could not follow. I was almost ready to give up the search when I spotted something. It was merely the outcast Lotus and her still faithful mate, Renogo. The Genghis pack was nowhere to be seen. Lotus had had her puppies. I couldn't help thinking how lucky these pups were that Lotus had stayed away from the pack for they too might have fallen victim to havoc or at best suffered Solo's fate. With care and attention, Solo flourished. Exercised every day, her legs deformed by her journey began to grow straight and strong. She would soon be ready to take up the natural nomadic life of an African wild dog. That Hugo would eventually find the Genghis pack, we knew. Solo might, by then, be too large to be accepted back. But we were determined, somehow, to set her free. With all she had been through, Solo deserved her freedom. Jane and Hugo arrive at the den of the outcast Lotus. A Genghis pack has not been found. And if Solo is to be spared a life in captivity, she must now be returned to the wild. With Solo protected in a cage with a trap door, an attempt will be made to introduce her into Lotus's pack. When we felt Solo would be at least reasonably safe, I would open the door with a string. Would the dogs accept a strange puppy? Or kill it? We had to know before releasing her what the dogs' reactions to Solo meant. The dogs, while inquisitive, seemed afraid of the cage. This made it impossible to accurately judge their reactions to Solo. Then Lotus's curiosity seemed to override her fear. Solo was making submissive gestures. Did she sense that Lotus might harm her? Or was she simply expressing an intense desire to join her? Suddenly, Lotus seemed to lose interest. We had to make a decision quickly. We decided to risk it. The door was open, but Solo retreated to the back of the cage. We wondered if she sensed danger. We held our breath. What happened now would be our responsibility. Solo was accepted. With Lotus and her pups, just a little younger than she, Solo had found a family. As Solo rushed to join the others, I couldn't help but think of Angel. If only she could see her puppy now, strong and ready to embark on a nomadic life as a full-fledged member of a pack. Hunting would be good, food plentiful. On the plains of the Serengeti, the dry season was almost over. 